down to season one, could you have predicted your character would have played such a vital role in the show? <laughs> no. <laughs> uh, there's a very simple answer to that. No, no idea at all. And I don't think they had any idea. Well, I know they didn't. I mean, I, um, they had no kind of... They never had a Bible for the show, so it kind of always did it by the seat of their pants. So, uh, no, I had no idea. In the, in the second season... Uh, there was the episode called One Breath, and that was the first time there was kind of a major uh, scene between Mulder and me, and they showed me in my apartment and whatever, and that's when I said, I have watched presidents die and all of those things. And uh, uh, and that that was the, you know, that was the biggest scene I'd had up until that time. And, and I know... Uh, from talking to Bob Goodwin and who's become a friend subsequently that they were they, they didn't know what they were getting into because the writers had written this but they had never bothered to investigate whether I was a good actor or not they had just hired me because of the way I looked I think uh, so they were a little nervous about that but they were very happy after it happened and, um, and then uh, the rest is history I guess as they say what would you say the most challenging part about playing him was how did you prepare um, but that's a good question. Um, the, the, I mean, the most, the key thing for me was to find out why I'm really the hero of the show, or put another way, to find out why I'm doing what I believe has to be done, and uh, what Mulder is doing, what should not be done, and and aligning myself with with the character's motives and goals and whatever they might be. There were many challenges going along because the uh, the backstory kept changing um, because, the, as I say, there was no Bible. So there was, you know, early on, I thought I was the top dog. You know, I thought I was a big guy. And then all of a sudden I go to a meeting of the syndicate and they're giving me heck because I'm late for the meeting. And I think, who are these people? I thought I was in charge. So, you know, there's a constant adjusting process it's not difficult to do one just has to keep on top of it so one of the uh, one of the really fun things about doing the, the whole thing was getting the script and working out why and how does it work and how does it fit what what's what's making me do what I'm doing and what am I doing and um, it was always a challenge and, and fun to do nice. what was it like being part of the X-Files phenomenon back in the 90s when it was really taking off that was so weird. That was so amazing. I mean, one never imagined that uh, A, one was going to do a lead in a big TV series, and B, that the TV series itself would be, as you say, such a phenomenon. Um, and uh, so it was bewildering in many ways. I mean, I, I know the first time I kind of went into a... Uh, electronic store. I was going to buy something, I can't remember. And uh, the uh, service guy said, you know, could, could I have a picture with you? Okay, sure. And he was stood beside me and he was shaking. He was so nervous being that close to someone in this show. I mean, it, so, you know, I thought, oh, that's interesting. You know, and then there were all sorts of other things that happened, like, uh, like Richard Dawkins condemning this the series and Richard Dawkins being my favorite uh, author and scientist and skeptic and, and how do I deal with that? And so it was pretty interesting. But I have certainly a um, a, a, a feeling, a, I mean, a, a real bonding of, of, of those of us involved in the show and some of that's continued as we've gone on to do fan conventions since so that, uh, you know, that relationship continues. Um, uh, and there was a kind of a subgroup for a while, uh, which was the Canadian actors within the series. And we kind of bonded in our own kind of way because, because we were the Canadians. <laughs> and uh, I mean, they were wonderful people to work with. I mean, Kim Manners and uh, Rob Bowman and I would, we were all water skiers on top of everything else. So we shared a lot of water ski experiences. And Rob recommended to me a a water ski lake I could ski in near Los Angeles. And so there were lots of, lots of things like that, I guess. 
Uh, can you tell us a little bit about the transition from acting in the X-Files to writing such an important episode? How did you feel it came out? Uh, that was quite an experience. That was a really interesting experience because I, I really didn't know how they worked on their scripts when I jumped in and said, you know, I'd like to do a, like to try writing an episode. And they said, great. And partly what I wanted to do was write one that I would work with Jillian because in seven years I'd never had a scene with her. I hadn't really done anything except the uh, the, the pilot where I gave her funny looks, <laughs> but we hadn't actually worked. <laughs> so that was kind of the premise of trying to do an episode. So we talked about some stuff, and then I went off and wrote an episode, and, uh, which had things that I loved in it because Chris Carter was always talking about somehow he's got to get the smoking man to water ski because he knew I was a water skier. I had put that in the episode. And I had taught Scully to water ski and oh, kinds of interesting things. And yeah, well, no, 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 Bill, that's not how we do it. <laughs> we don't just go write an episode. We sit down as a committee, as a the writing committee, and we block it out. Um, so then we did that and worked through the structure of the episode. And then I went back and wrote another draft. Uh, and then Chris Carter rewrote it. And that's how it ended up. So how did it come out? In, in, in some ways, good. But um, there was a fundamental weakness, I thought, which was why, why Smoking Man throws the uh, magic tape into the lake, why he gets rid of it. Um, and both Rob Bowman and I thought, this is not clear enough, you know, and we kind of appealed to Chris, but Chris said, no, no, it's clear in the script. And, you know, there's kind of reference in the script, but not really enough. Um, I still subscribe to J.B. Priesting, the famous British playwright, saying, if you want the audience to know something, you have to say it three times um, as a kind of general rule of thumb. Uh, so I don't think it was clear enough what the, what the arc was for the character. You know, that he really decided, no, no, this is too much. We cannot go there. Be like Trump backing off, saying, no, we won't do it. <laughs> um, uh, it's too much. But um, but in, in many ways, I, I, I liked it in many ways. A lot of good things in it, and I love working with Rob on it. But, Can you tell us about returning to the set for the reboots? Your character seems invincible. You've died like 18 <laughs> times. <laughs> How, you know, what was it like returning 14 years later um, to, the, to the series all over again? Well, for one thing, it's really interesting when you say 14 years later, because I don't think to any of us it felt like that. It felt like kind of um, just well, a day or two ago. <laughs> you know, it didn't feel like a long time had passed. Um, it, in that sense, we just sort of picked up quite readily kind of where we left off in one sense. I had something to cope with because I had been hit by a cruise missile. And so you don't just get up from being hit by a cruise missile. <laughs> um, so we had this, uh, you know, mammoth makeup and uh, hospital scene and, you know, all this, all this stuff. So all that was not my favorite part of being an actor where you spend four hours in the makeup chair. But... Um, but it worked, you know, it, it, it somehow found a way to bring me back to life. And uh, um, and then with the magic of self-healing, I mean, I had to smoke through the tracheotomy and then somehow that healed by, by the second reboot. And, but um, anything can happen in the next box. Right. Do you think you survived being shot and dropped into the, the water? Oh, that wasn't me. That wasn't you? That was a hologram. No. Oh. I had to explain that to Chris, too, in case he wants to bring me back. <laughs> what was it like working more with Annabeth Gish in the revival? It was great. I mean, I had really admired her work uh, in the uh, in the original series, which and I had really no contact with her because at that point, I was kind of out of the series because David was out of the series, so our story was out of the series for a while. Well, she really kind of took over, and I had a great respect for what she did and really liked what she did. So it was really a pleasure to actually work with her. 
we were a little confused as to what the relationship actually was between uh, between her character and mine. Um, but uh, it was fun. It was fun. No, it was great to work with her. Yeah. Do you have a favorite episode from working over all the years? Um, I would still go back to Talitha Kimmy, I think. Um, I mean, it had it had lots of good stuff. Um, it had the kind of real philosophical argument with um, with the uh, shapeshifter in the in the whatever where he was locked up. Um, and do you know the story of how we had to redo that scene live? No. Um, well, if it <laughs> sidetracks slightly, let me tell you. Yeah. Um, sometime after the series was finished, I guess, I got an email from this wealthy man in New York, and he and his wife were going to uh, renew their wedding vows, and he wanted to present her with a big surprise. They had fallen in love with each other watching Talitha Kumi. So he wanted me to come to New York and do the scene live at this celebration, uh, unexpected to his wife. So he flew me at first class, did all kinds of lovely things for me. And to make it even better, um, uh, the actor's name escapes me just for a moment, who was playing the other character, lives in New York. So we got him together and we actually rehearsed the scene live. And so at their uh, anniversary celebration, we were actually behind a curtain. And at a certain point, they opened the curtain and we did the scene live in front of gaping people wondering where on earth we had come from. Why do you think The X-Files is still relevant to old fans and new generations 27 years later? Um, not quite for the same reasons, I think, as it was originally. Um, well, no, some of the same reasons. But what I think was remarkable in the 90s was that we were in a period of really uh, questioning what's real and what's not real. As we moved from print, which is a really kind of hard, fixed medium, onto the internet, and um, started seeing things through a screen and not a very clear screen and the screen where things disappeared often and we lost them. And uh, there was a whole kind of, um, you know, we used to be able to say, well, I know it's true because it's in a book. And now we'd say, well, I know it's true because it's on the internet. Well, no, it's not on the internet. It was on the internet. Where did it go? Um, so there was this kind of fluidity. So then the X-Files was a story, or much of its original manifestation, about taking things that people believed to be true, but probably weren't, but said, let's suppose they were true. I mean, let's suppose um, that aliens are among us. Let's suppose that people were abducted by aliens. Let's suppose that um, astrology works, or let's suppose all of these things. And what happens? What does that mean? And so all of that was, I think, a particular to the zeitgeist of the 90s. What was also part of that time, but is continuing to be part of that time, is the whole business of conspiracies and the whole belief in conspiracies, or there may be conspiracies, or imagining there may be conspiracies, or enjoying the, 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 the fantasy of, of, of uh, conspiracies. And I think that's a lot of what what... what Appeals in the story now. Nice. I have the last question, but I'm going to sneak one more in there that I just thought of. <laughs> what was your favorite part about playing Swisson? It's so fun to play the bad guy. I mean, all actors say that. I don't know. I don't know what it is in us that, that we want to be the bad guy, but somehow it's m more interesting. It's more stimulating. It's more challenging than just being a nice person. Um, and you, and you, and and you get to have power. You know. I mean, um, 
Uh, you know, I started smoking when I was 12. I had long since given up by the time we did the show. But I started smoking at 12 because it made me feel big and important at age 12. Um, so going back to the DSM, it still made me feel big and important. So, you know, all of those things. Yeah. yeah. Um, if you could say something to the fans of the last, over the last 25 years or of the last 25 plus years, what would it be? Don't believe everything you see on TV. 